this fall. I'm so excited. What? <laughs> from the inspiring to the amazing. You're in the presence of history. The compelling. He said, welcome home. It was just a powerful moment. To the astounding. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> and from the breathtaking. This is real. A journey to Mars. To the electrifying. We're going to change the world. All this and more. All this fall. Oh, my God. One for Peter. Score! <laughs> 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 Hurry up! The bus is coming! the bus? <gasps> WPBS TV is pleased to bring you the fourth season of Cinema 6 with a new lineup of community screenings and events. Join us as we feature local productions along with national public broadcasting programs each month, beginning in September and concluding in February 2018. Screenings are free and open to the public unless otherwise noted. Special events will require a ticket purchase. Get all the details online at wpbstv.org slash cinema6. Did you know that public broadcasting was created as a public-private system on purpose? The federal government thought that if they could provide seed money for PBS stations nationwide, each station would then be accountable to raise the remaining funds to complete its mission work. If the stations are successful, it's because they're doing exactly what they were created to do, sir. Individual support at WPBS accounts for the largest portion of our annual budget. When you become a member of WPBS, you're supporting programming, production, education, and media engagement events just like this one. Please consider becoming a member today, at any level, and help us continue to serve this beautiful Two Nation community with award-winning content and literacy and cultural events. In the modern world, we ride the crest of a wave. Every day, innovators discover new and better ways of meeting our needs. The greatest innovations are routinely replicated worldwide, except in education, which has remained stubbornly at anchor while the rest of the world has sailed past it. In the next hour, policy analyst Andrew Coulson explores why our classrooms have yet to be transformed by a similar wave. The same kind of innovative wave that has revolutionized and improved every other aspect of our lives. We crisscross the globe in our search for answers to the essential question, how do we attain educational excellence? In the Barrio neighborhood of East Los Angeles, a uniquely gifted teacher becomes an unlikely hero showing his Garfield High School students how to shatter expectations. He taught us to be strong and to stand up for what you believe in. Time. Three seconds. 
But the same drive and determination that fueled Jaime Escalante's unparalleled success with the students of Garfield High also proved to be his downfall. He was setting a precedent. A lot of the teachers were resentful, and it was very public. 5,000 miles away, in a very different culture, Andrew Coulson finds an amazing similarity in the competitive spirit of a baseball game and what students must do to get into college. In my case, I stay up all night before the exam, maybe during six weeks. Here, in Seoul, South Korea, the fierce competition for entrance to the very best colleges, paired with cutting-edge technology, has propelled a unique educational industry to soaring heights. 95% of all South Korean students attend intensive after-school tutoring sessions called hagwans. It is a market, like, it is an entire market, and the consumer, a student, likes the product that is better than any other. So teachers compete within the market to become, like, entertaining and educative at the same time, you know? For the last 10 years, uh, my whole uh, lecture revenue is over hundred million dollars. Isolated examples of success and innovation do occur in education, but seldom have such examples been expanded or scaled up to improve the educational systems that serve the masses, that improve the basic quality of life, that lift people out of poverty. Join us as Andrew Coulson explores the challenge of replicating educational excellence in School, Inc. It's often said that education is different from other fields. And there's one respect in which that's certainly true. But to really see it, we have to stop and step back in time to the late 1970s. Recognize this? It's the original Sony Walkman introduced in 1979, the first mainstream personal music player. And on the eve of its release, the Japanese media were in solid agreement. They thought it would flop. Sony itself expected to sell only about 5,000 a month. And then a funny thing happened. People kind of liked it. Within two years, Sony had sold a million and a half Walkmans worldwide sparking similar products from other companies that sold millions more. But that was just the beginning. Every year or two, new and improved models hit the market. To earn enough to buy the original Walkman, you had to work two weeks at a typical minimum wage job. And that was for lo-fi sound on cassettes you had to flip over every half an hour. What's really amazing about the rapid spread and improvement of personal audio players is that it isn't amazing at all. It's perfectly normal. Great new gadgets and services are appearing and going viral every day. A decade ago, no one had ever heard of Google. Now they do tens of thousands of internet searches per second. Facebook went from zero to half a billion members in just five years. And the same thing is true outside the high-tech world in everything from organic grocery stores to disposable diapers. Basically, invent something good, and it gets big. And these days, it gets big fast. But of all the products we make and the services we provide, there's one that stands out as an exception to that overall pattern. One activity in which excellence doesn't spawn countless imitators or spread on a massive scale. And that exception is schooling. For generations, there hasn't been a single innovation in teaching that has transformed classrooms and improved student achievement worldwide. The closest thing to it can be found here, inside this 19th century schoolhouse. Let's have a look. And here it is, the blackboard. 
For the first 2,000 years of education history, it was hard for teachers to communicate complex visual information to groups of students. Wax tablets, like the one shown in this Greek vase painting, had been around since the 5th century BC, and that's how children learned to write, etching letters into the wax, rubbing them out, and starting over. Useful as they were, they didn't allow teachers to reach the whole class all at once. Twenty centuries later, we'd made the great leap forward to these. Slate tablets and chalk. Bit of an improvement, certainly they're easier to erase, but it wasn't until the late 1700s that a Scottish schoolmaster named James Pillins had a really clever idea. He took all of those tablets off of students' laps and he hung them together on the wall. Suddenly, every student could see exactly what Pillins was talking about at the same time. In a flash, the blackboard leapt across the Atlantic to the United States Military Academy at West Point. And just a few decades later, it was a common item even in remote rural schoolhouses, like this one. So there's an example of a brilliant educational idea, simple and effective, that took the world by storm in barely a generation. We know it can happen. But that was 200 years ago, and nothing quite like it has happened since. Why haven't our classrooms been transformed by that same pattern of improvement and innovation that we take for granted in every other aspect of our lives? It's not that we haven't tried. Schools have adopted all sorts of new technologies over the years, from projectors to personal computers to smart whiteboards. The trouble is that none of these new inventions has improved outcomes, measurable outcomes, on a global scale. Let's take a look at something. American test scores at the end of high school have been flat since we started keeping track of them all the way back in the early 1970s. And the same thing is true in most other countries as well. Basically, educational quality has been stuck in the era of disco and leisure suits for 40 years, while the rest of the world has passed it by. <laughs> Classrooms and clothes look a little different now than they did back then, but we've changed the trappings of education without really improving the substance. The best schools haven't grown and taken over the less successful ones. The best teaching methods haven't been replicated on a mass scale. And while our top athletes and pop stars reach huge audiences, our greatest teachers seldom reach more than a few dozen kids at a time, despite all our technological advances. Why not? That's the question at the heart of this series. Why doesn't excellence scale up and spawn imitators in education? the way it does in other fields. We'll travel the globe in search of an answer to that question, and we'll take a few detours along the way, because the shortest route isn't always a straight line. In our quest to learn how educational excellence can be replicated on a mass scale, Korea's private tutoring sector offers some enticing clues. Its top teachers reach tens or even hundreds of thousands of students. We just have to figure out how they do it. And as long as we're playing detective, it makes sense to look for the means, motive, and opportunity driving that growth. Could it be as simple as choice for families, competition for schools, and freedom for educators? If so, we'd expect to see the same kind of growth among U.S. private schools. College prep schools in particular seem like a prime suspect. They're chosen by parents, and since many accept boarding students, they're in competition with each other nationwide. And in one respect, many prep schools have reached enormous proportions, their physical size. This, for instance, is the 315-acre campus of the Cranbrook Schools here in Bloomfield, Michigan. But despite their often spacious grounds, most prep schools serve only a few hundred students. Cranbrook is among the largest, enrolling roughly 1,700 pupils when its lower, middle, and upper schools are taken together. Clearly, there's some missing ingredient. 
something that Korea's tutoring sector enjoys that America's prep schools lack. But what? The people that are in the competitive market with us, each are gonna offer something unique that fits each individual. I can't imagine that one school could fit every need. We happen to have a place that I think works well for a lot of people. I come from a family of educators and most of my family works in public schools. But I felt in private schools, um, you have more autonomy and flexibility, creativity is valued, and so the practice of teaching is, at least for me, easier in an independent school. That's the essence uh, of what I think is a very important uh, differentiator in terms of education. The freedom to hire faculty who you feel will be a good match to the mission of the school and its philosophy. I always think about how this place started as farmland. And an analogy for me is, you know, how land is cultivated to produce and, and to yield, you know, its bounty. And working in the classroom with the students here, you're very much um, able to do that. You are cultivating learners, you are cultivating artists, you are cultivating scientists, you are working with um, these young people. Right, we've got an institute of science right here, and uh, that staff will make themselves available for getting into the planetarium to give an astronomy class a unique view of retrograde motion of Mars, for example. Prep schools generally do well on traditional measures of educational outcomes, test scores, graduation rates, matriculation to selective colleges. But we have to put those outcomes in context. These schools are academically selective, so how can we tell how much of their success is due to effective teaching and how much to the bright, highly advantaged students they happen to enroll? One way is to see how students' performance changes from the time they are admitted to their graduating year. The bigger the gain, the greater the school's contribution is likely to be. And that contribution varies from one school to the next, but in some cases, like Cranbrook's, it seems to be substantial. Another way to gauge school quality is just ask students themselves. The first minute I walked into the classroom, I was just astonished by the freedom that students were given, not only in the classroom, but outside the classrooms. And just the level of trust between the students and the teachers and how there's so much respect given to the teachers and also so much respect returned. For one of my classes, it deals with the uh, Art Institute. Also with like the sculptures on campus, we have so many sculptures, so many statues. And so uh, once a week, usually the teacher takes us outside on like a mini adventure. It's great. One side of it is the faculty, which I personally think are fantastic. You know, they're obviously well educated on their subjects. But I think the other side is being surrounded by, you know, kids who are intellectually curious. This school has fostered more than a love of education, but a love of like learning, learning not only through books, but through people. No single school is right for every child, but this one seems well-liked by its students and academically effective. It's easy to see why parents might want to send their children here. Which brings us to another possible reason why prep schools might not scale up. Insufficient demand. After all, they're expensive. Financial assistance is available, but the full sticker price for day tuition can reach $40,000 a year. Cranbrook is a relative deal at $29,000 for its upper school. But as it turns out, most prep schools have more applicants than they can accommodate. And in addition to having enough demand to justify expansion, prep schools have also had plenty of time for it. Most of them are venerable institutions whose histories and traditions are a key source of their appeal. This place was given away by a really wealthy family, and this was their land, and they built the school, and they wanted it to serve the community, and they wanted all the community, not just the well-off kids, and that continues today with uh, various programs. The majority of prep schools can trace their histories back over a century or more. Linden Hall was founded in the 1740s, and Milton Academy, the 1790s. By contrast, 
Korea's tutoring firms didn't debut until the 1970s, and most are more recent than that. Despite that novelty, they've grown explosively. Or maybe because of that novelty. What if the grand histories and traditions of prep schools have made them hidebound? What if they're too set in their ways to adopt the latest technologies? That theory is certainly plausible. It's also wrong. Prep schools have begun to use internet video to reach students beyond their own campuses. The same technology used by Korean tutors to reach tens or even hundreds of thousands of students. But prep schools use it a little differently. We were among the founding schools of the Global Online Academy. It brings us the capacity uh, to offer our faculty uh, to classrooms uh, far beyond the Midwest. We have students now who are in our own global online uh, classrooms here at school who are in classrooms alongside of uh, students in Hawaii, in Jordan, uh, in Malaysia. Our belief is that online learning will never fill the space uh, that bricks and mortar education holds. We are uh, centrally committed to the presence of faculty and students in one space. We believe that there is no substitute for a student and a faculty uh, being able to sit on two sides of a log and musing. So prep schools have the quality, demand, technology, and time to grow into national networks. They just don't. We're running out of plausible explanations here, so let's turn to a counterintuitive one. What if they just can't afford it? That may seem unlikely, given the substantial fees they charge, but tuition actually fails to cover their full operating costs. Virtually all prep schools raise additional funding for their operating budgets from annual donations. Maybe there just isn't anything left over for expansion. Unfortunately, that explanation doesn't hold water either. In addition to their revenue from annual giving, most prep schools also have large endowments. Over $200 million in the case of Cranbrook schools and a billion dollars in the case of Phillips Exeter in New Hampshire. And yet, the best endowed prep schools don't invest their endowments in national expansion. Why not? One answer is that it would be difficult to preserve the character of these institutions beyond their original locations. Because our campus is so unique and because the campus is so much embedded as part of the curriculum, that it would be difficult to duplicate that experience and still call it Cranbrook. But that just begs a deeper question. Why is the focus on sustaining a particular experience rather than on reaching a wider audience? It might have something to do with the reasons people donate to these schools in the first place. Many times it's based on their own experience, meaning the donors are our alumni. And so based on the, the alumni's experience, they want to be able to give back to the institution, which helped them, nurtured them, supported them. So even if their donations could theoretically finance a major expansion, that's generally not what they're for. What we've learned, in other words, is that Sherlock Holmes and friends have it right. It's not enough to find a suspect with the means and the opportunity they also have to have the motive. And America's prestigious prep schools, though they have many wonderful qualities, simply don't have a motive to scale up. They're striving to perpetuate beloved traditions, not to start national franchises. Subsidizing education through voluntary philanthropy seems to offer a lot of freedom to parents and donors. But what about teachers? And how could we even measure the difference? I don't know about you, but I could use a beer. Maybe I should rephrase that. The beer itself is not going to help us answer this question. 
but a technique developed by a master brewer actually will. Enter William Seeley Gossett, a young chemist at the Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland. Gossett's job was to improve the beer without having to raise the price. That meant doing experiments to identify things like the best ingredients. But those experiments took time and they cost money. So Gossett had to figure out ways of extracting useful conclusions from just a few small scale studies. The company was so keen on his efforts that it gave him a year long sabbatical to research statistics in London. Their decision paid off. Gossett developed a technique for drawing conclusions from very small studies, making statistics a useful and affordable way for Guinness to improve its products. The company was so impressed by Gossett's breakthrough that they didn't really want other breweries to learn about it. Nevertheless, they let him publish his work anonymously. Gossett chose the alias Student, so his technique became known as Student's T-Test, and it's still used by scientists all over the world. In fact, that's why we're interested in Gossett. His test can help us answer our question about regulatory differences between vouchers and tax credits. As this chart illustrates, the difference is substantial. Joining a voucher program is expected to more than triple the amount of red tape educators have to contend with. That's a much bigger burden than the one expected for participating in a tax credit program. One reason for the difference might be that tax credit programs, like the one in Pennsylvania, rely on voluntary private funding. No one is forced to donate to a scholarship granting organization, and anyone who does can pick the organization that receives their funds. It's a system that is directly accountable to both donors and parents, so there's little incentive for piling on regulation. Vouchers, on the other hand, are public dollars. All taxpayers have to pay for them, and yet they have no direct say over how those dollars are spent. As a result, some legislators feel they must use regulations to control how vouchers are used. Unfortunately, as we saw in India, Chile, and Sweden, those regulations are not always helpful. In most countries, we not only make it cumbersome to operate an individual school, we make it hard for innovators to scale up successful ones, much harder than it is to replicate excellence in other fields. That's kind of a big deal. How big? And that's why we've come here to the outskirts of Manchester, England. Because this is where the wave began in the late 1700s. This was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. And it's where the American Francis Cabot Lowell learned how to build a water-powered textile mill from the people who first developed them. And yet, the most dramatic thing about the Industrial Revolution is not the machinery, but the transformation it caused in the standard of living. For the first 200,000 years of human history and prehistory, the average person survived on $3 a day or less. In 1798, a Brit named Thomas Malthus famously described this problem and claimed that the population would always rise faster than the supply of food and other resources, so the standard of living could never rise. Ironically, Malthus was absolutely right about the way the world worked right up until his own generation. In the two centuries since, the world's population skyrocketed. According to Malthus, that should have led to global starvation. Instead, the standard of living rose even faster than the population. In the countries that caught the wave early, average incomes shot upwards by a factor of more than 30, from $3 a day to 100. That is the real wave, a tide of innovation so colossal that it swept away the Malthusian population barrier. After 200 millennia of stagnation, sustained progress in human welfare finally became the norm. And it all began here in the United Kingdom in the mid 18th century. So what was Britain's secret ingredient? There's no shortage of theories. 
Was it a higher savings rate, international trade, exploited workers, colonialism, greed, modern science, the Protestant work ethic, railroads, canals, and on and on. There have been dozens of possible explanations offered since people started to notice the wave. Until shortly before the Industrial Revolution, earning a living was scorned by the elites of every society on Earth. If you worked with your hands, you were beneath the notice of dignified people. And if you ran a business, you were beneath their contempt. The widespread loathing of entrepreneurship has to have made opening a business less appealing. If all that hostility prevented the rise of the great wave, it's terrible news for education. After all, running a business that earns money educating kids is still widely despised today. Consider the case of Reed Hastings, the founder and CEO of Netflix. After college, Hastings joined the Peace Corps and went to Swaziland to teach high school students. In the 1990s, while he was hatching the idea for Netflix, Hastings also took graduate courses in education because he wanted to understand why schools were lagging while other fields were leaping ahead. Sound familiar? Since then, Hastings has given millions to educational charities, but has decided not to start an education business. He told a reporter he didn't want people to think he was doing it for the money. So education can have some of Hastings' charity, but it can't have his entrepreneurial leadership. But outside of education, that attitude started to change around the year 1600. A new way of talking about commerce appeared alongside the old one. Shakespeare himself was a transitional figure. In addition to casting characters who fit the old negative mold, he introduced a few who shattered it. His comedy of errors, for instance, is full of business people who are basically nice. They're polite, they honor their contracts, and they don't try to cut chunks out of each other. In the years that followed, favorable references to commerce appeared in English plays, essays, and novels. Many of them are now forgotten, but others, not so much. If this little bungalow looks familiar, it might be because it was featured in the television adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. As with most of Jane Austen's books, it is filled with pompous gentry who sneer at anyone who works for a living. But in Austen, those are the bad guys. For instance, the conniving Bingley sisters mock our heroine, Lizzie Bennet, for having an uncle who's a merchant. But though he works in Cheapside, they're not criticizing him for being poor. Cheapside is an actual street in London, and in Austen's day, it was an upscale shopping district. The Bingley sisters mock Lizzie's uncle because he earned his money in trade instead of getting it the right way from a dead relative. That opportunity for entrepreneurs to earn people's respect, says economist Deirdre McCloskey, is what caused the great wave of innovation that raised the standard of living worldwide by a factor of 10, a factor of 30 in the nations that adopted it early. She doesn't argue that mundane economic factors like financial incentives, competition, and consumer choice were unimportant, just that they were insufficient. But is she right? It's too soon to say with confidence, but one thing we can say is that her theory meshes well with the story of education. Then as now, education was perhaps the only field in which successful entrepreneurship was not celebrated and so did not flourish. Where it has begun to thrive in modern times, it is only in exceptional places where resistance to education as a business has lessened. But even if McCloskey does turn out to be wrong, we're still left with a choice in how we think about people who work for a living, whether it's digging ditches, running a shop, or building a school network. A choice between, say, Jane Austen's snobbish Bingley sisters or her open-minded Lizzie Bennet. Who do we want to be? What if we allowed all education entrepreneurs to put their own money on the line in an effort to better serve us? Gaining or losing based on their successes and failures, just as entrepreneurs do in other fields. And what if we made sure that everyone had access to that wide open marketplace? Would we then see excellent scale up in education?
PBS 